What makes things shiny? Well, the full answer to this question lies within the field of quantum electrodynamics, which is all about the interactions between light and matter. It's a pretty important physical theory, and it's the reason why Richard Feynman won his Nobel Prize in Physics in 1965. But don't worry, the mechanism discussed in this video is simple enough, as both reflectivity and shininess depend on how incoming light gets re-emitted by things. You may remember from chemistry that metals are formed of positively charged ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. These free moving electrons are key to understanding why metals are shiny. You may think of these electrons as forming a negatively charged cloud on and just below the surface of the metal. As we know, light is an oscillating electromagnetic wave. When incoming light hits the surface of the metal, it causes the electron field to oscillate. Some areas become more positively charged, while others get negatively charged to mirror the polarity of that wave. Since the electrons are negatively charged and like charges repel, they avoid negative charge and accumulate in the positively charged areas. The electron cloud is now polarized. But the act of polarizing the electron cloud creates another electromagnetic wave, this one being out of phase with the first one since all the electrons have gathered in the positive areas and made these areas slightly negatively charged and vice versa. This wave is radiated from the surface and we see it as the shine of the metal. The more mobile electrons there are, the more the incoming wave interacts with them, which is why conductive materials such as metals usually are shiny, since conductivity also relies on having plenty of free electrons. So that clears up how non-luminescent objects, ones that don't produce their own light, can appear to have a shine. But what's to stop a shiny marble floor tile from becoming a new bathroom mirror? The difference between a shiny object and a reflective one isn't due to how much light gets re-emitted. It's about how the light is re-emitted relative to the incoming rays. Let me explain. Usually, when we see an object, light bounces off it in different directions and the photons are scattered with different phases. This means that the information carried by the incoming photons is no longer intact so we don't see a reflection but we can see the object itself because it did reflect light, just in a diffuse way. However, when a mirror reflects light, it does so in a uniform, specular way. This is the kind of reflection you learn about in school, where the angle of incidence simply equals the angle of reflection. This keeps the initial information intact, which allows us to see a reflection. So basically, a smooth surface ensures that the original image undergoes as little scattering as possible and remains intact enough for us to be able to see it. This is why a polished piece of metal is much more reflective than a freshly cut piece. But what about diamonds? Diamonds are shiny too, but for a slightly different reason. The electrons inside the diamond structure aren't free, so a diamond has to be cut in such a way that when light enters, it bounces around inside the diamond for a while before it leaves in different directions. The process of light hitting a boundary and then being reflected back inside, rather than passing straight through, is called total internal reflection. And this is what gives diamonds, or glass, or water, their shine. So how does total internal reflection happen? If you watched our last video, you already know all about refraction and the refractive indices. So if you haven't already seen that, I'd recommend watching that too. What we didn't cover in that video was what happens as you keep increasing the angle of incidence. That is, the angle the incoming light makes with the normal at the boundary. Clearly, if you raise the angle of incidence, theta 1, then the angle of refraction, theta 2, must also increase. So far, so good, right? But what happens when the angle of refraction gets to 90 degrees? Well, it turns out there's a special name for the angle of incidence that allows this to happen, the critical angle, theta c. The reason why this angle is critical is that as soon as the angle of incidence exceeds this angle, refraction no longer occurs and we get total internal reflection. So this allows the light to remain inside the diamond and get transmitted out in a bunch of different directions, almost as if the diamond were producing its own light. But wait, there's more we can figure out with this critical angle stuff. If we analyse Snell's law in the specific case where n1 sine theta c equals n2 sine theta 2, we see that sine theta 2 must be the sine of 90 degrees, which is 1. So we can get rid of that term and take the n1 over to the right hand side, which gives us a formula for the critical angle at the boundary between any two materials, 
given their respective refractive indices. This is great because it allows us to see how easily total internal reflection can happen. The lower the critical angle is, the more often it will happen. In order for the critical angle to be low, N1 must be high, assuming N2 is just the refractive index of air. And as you might expect, diamond does have a pretty high refractive index. For scale, a, a vacuum by definition has a refractive index of 1. Air is around 1.0003, water around 1.333, and crown glass is usually between 1.5 and 1.6. Diamond has a refractive index of 2.417. This is why diamonds appear so shiny. Total internal reflection. So there you have it. You should now know a little bit more about why some objects are shiny. But if you really want to get stuck into this question, have a look at the links in the description. We'd also really appreciate it if you could leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.